The fourth principle is that journalists must maintain an independence from the people they cover. This is critical because journalists and politicians and cops all live together. Uh, at one point in the Mulroney years, I had a member of my family, <coughs> pardon me, who was Minister of External Affairs. And I was hosting As It Happens, and I would have to interview her. And I would say, well, you know, Barbara, Barbara McDougall, I'm your brother-in-law, right? You're both friends. And that would tell the audience that I, that I knew this person very well. It's prompted a letter from Halifax, <coughs> which said, I often wondered how an incompetent like you got the job on As It Happens, and now I know. <laughs> <clears throat> Number five, journalists must act as independent monitors of power. The cliche is tell truth, speak truth to power. The fact of the matter is, the power knows what the truth is. So, it, yes, you should speak truth about it, but more than that, you should monitor it. And journalists don't, don't do that. The sixth principle is that journalism must provide a forum for public criticism. We are common carriers of public discussions, or should be. We should open up transparently our processes, our methods, so that people understand how things work. And I think a lot of people are, <coughs> pardon me, confused by how things work. The, the uh, seventh principle that they came up with at Pew was to make the important thing relevant and interest, interesting. And that is very tricky. That's very hard to do. Years ago, I was on the editorial board of the Globe and Mail. Uh, and Trudeau came for lunch one day. And <coughs> I was introduced by the editor as, say, as someone said, uh, oh, and this is the writer who writes the short, funny editorials. And Trudeau said, well, I want to meet the guy who writes the long, funny editorials. <laughs> um, I was assigned, I was the junior on the board, and I was assigned by the editor, a wonderful man named Dick Do Richard Doyle, to read up about the Crow's Nest Pass Agreement. I see you're galvanized by that. <laughs> Crow's Nest Pass was an agreement that uh, wheat farmers on one side of the Rockies paid a certain amount to have their grain taken to uh, ships and people on the other side were paid another amount. I became an expert on the Crow's Nest Pass, and I would write editorial. It was the greatest aid to sleeping uh, <laughs> since, since sleeping pills. But I became an expert, and the context was everything. Now, I'm sure I drove people crazy. The other assignment I had, uh, Doyle had a cottage in Wasega Beach, and his fixation was people who drive their cars on the beach. So every Monday morning when I went to work, I knew that I had to write another editorial, a this must stop kind of editorial, where driving a car on Wasega Beach was a crime that cried to heaven for justice. <laughs> Number eight, journalism has to make the news comprehensible and proportional. CNN, and I don't want to pick on them, but I will, <laughs> CNN sent seven times the number of employees to the wedding of Kate and, uh, what's his name, William, <laughs> as they did to the tsunami. Um, we, we team, thing, we, CBC sends tons of people, not so much anymore, but there's a dis we don't keep things in proportion. <coughs> Pardon me. Once we get a hold of something and run with it, we don't stop. We will milk it to death. I covered the funeral of, um, in London of uh, the Queen Mother. And people said, well, who cares? I mean, that was essentially a wonderful old woman. I had met her once or twice. <coughs> Loved gin and tonic with a bit of lemon. Um, <laughs> Until, and I wondered what I was doing. Why, why were we doing it? Until I walked across Westminster Bridge and I saw the lineups 
of people, um, children, old people, and it went on for over two miles of people trying to get to Westminster Hall where the body was laid out. But we tried to keep it in proportion, uh, and we did, I think, a fairly good job. People were interested in that death. Number nine, the last principle, this is very tricky, and employers hate this one. Journalists must be allowed to exercise their personal conscience. Every reporter should have a personal sense of ethics. In other words, a moral compass. I don't know if you know the name Chris Hedges. He is a former New York Times uh, foreign correspondent, war correspondent, who so, saw too much death and destruction in the course of his, uh, his work. And he has now become a Savonarola, as I said to him on the radio, of, of journalism. He is a finger-pointing, condemning um, conscience of what we in the media strive to do and so often fail to do. And he is <coughs> pardon me, critically important because he acts as a kind of cleansing agent, uh, a sort of Ajax for our grimy pots and pans. And it's, it's important that journalists, especially young ones, coming up, who understand their public responsibility. All the crap about, yeah, the journalists run toward the explosion and run to the bank robberies. Now, yes, sure, that's the glamour part of it. But the journalists who go and sit in the, in the courts for day after day after day and try and tell people what's going on or sit in a registry office searching a title, trying to find out who bought what and how much they paid for it. The dull, scratchy little effort of day-to-day of -day journalism is a must. We can't all be New York Times, Pulitzer Prize winning war correspondents. But we can have our own sense of what's right. And I think that that is, of the nine, these nine principles, um, I think that is the most, the most important. You have to let people, the audience is everything. You are monitors of our conduct the way we are supposed to be monitors of public conduct. And if you're not happy with the journalism you're getting, then you have to do something about it. You have to write my boss. You have to write letters to the editor. You have to write the principals or the teachers in, Jason, in journalism schools. And you have to demand what is properly yours. And, <coughs> pardon me, the thing that scares, uh, I've been doing this same thing for now for 50 years. I started in 1962 in Brampton, which had a population of 26,000 then. I made 38 bucks a week and lived at Mrs. Graham's boarding house. But, uh, that world disappeared a long time ago, and I'm glad it did. We now have new elements of journalism. <coughs> oh, pardon me, social media, although I wouldn't trust a citizen journalist any more than I would trust a citizen dentist. Um, <laughs> but what I do find is that people with cameras and sound things and, te and phones, they, there's no such thing anymore as an exclusivity to reporting. Everybody is a reporter now, apparently. And the trick is to make sure this wadge of information that we're making people crazy with uh, has some element of context, accuracy, and immediacy, and relevance. And without those things, we might as all well be reading the, the supermarket uh, tabloids. Um, actually, it was a supermarket tab that broke the story that everybody knew about John Edwards in the mainstream, or lamestream press, as Sarah Palin calls it. Uh, the National Enquirer broke the story. And now the man's on trial and facing a, a jail term of 40 years, which I'm happy to report. But we have to go back to the original precepts of what, why we got into the business in the first place. Uh, we didn't get in the business to read the National or to become a weatherman, or, or whatever. We got into business because we wanted to tell people what was going on. And we don't need new rules. We don't need new rules. We just have to go back and refine the old ones and stick to them. If you have any questions, thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> we, have, we have time for one question, and who's going to win the lottery? Good heavens. Just one? Did I go over my time? <coughs> I need this. You, you talked about the integrity of the journalistic process, yeah. which wasn't what I was expecting, frankly, when I read the title. Uh, I, and you didn't mention Fox News once, which has a, an inherent bias in it. At least that would be my observation. Can you, can you comment on that phenomenon for us? Well, I, as it said in the... Um, in some of the descriptions, I was talking about journalism. Um, Fox News is a uh, construct. It's a show busy thing. Um, it's the commentators uh, are performers. Um, it, to me, there's no sense of getting a story or doing that. To me, I, I find them not irrelevant because they can be very dangerous, <coughs> but they're not journalists. Bill O'Reilly is quite funny. He's a comedian, as is uh, Sean, what's his face? And Sean Hannity and O'Reilly, two Irishmen. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, they're comedians, they're performers. They make millions of dollars a year, and they do have influence. Rush Limbaugh has 30 million listeners a week, or a day, or something, whatever. But to confuse um, Fox News with journalism, I think, is to make a, is to make a leap that is, is, not, is not accurate. Um, I don't, as I say, on the television, I don't watch it, but every once in a while, one of the outrages comes along, and I have to look at it. Are um, Nobody who disagrees with Fox News watches them. The people in the audience for Limbaugh and uh, Hannity and so on know what they're going to get, and they watch them. Um, so there's no sense of any universalism. It's, uh, you're t if I can forgive me for using this simile, but it's like talking to the choir. Um, the, uh, the people who believe that Barack Obama is a Kenyan socialist, um, watch Fox News. The people that don't, don't. So I think you have to, when you go on, uh, on the Google and you look at um, uh, Media Matters, for example, which is a, a site that looks at right-wing <coughs> pardon me, right -wing, uh, news, so-called, and they point out all the time the outrages of Fox News, um, that gives you a fairly good idea of who these people are and what they do. Roger Ailes, started life as an immediate advisor to Richard Nixon. Need I say more? 